Okay, so please give a warm welcome to Matt, who will talk about living off the world garden. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be back at Recon. Um, is it possible to get the full screen on there? Or should I just share my full screen? Okay, so while we wait on the AV issues, um, I'll just give a brief introduction. So I'm Matt Graber, I'm the Director of Threat Research at Red Canary. And I'm gonna be talking about abusing the features, not exploiting, um, but abusing the features of the early launch anti-malware um, ecosystem in uh, Windows. Okay, great. So um, there will be a necessary introduction to what ELAM is and uh, protected process, uh, uh, yeah, protected process light processes. But before I get into that, I just wanted to acknowledge Alex Inescu and James Forshaw, um, uh, without whom none of this probably would have surfaced in the first place. So um, I can't tell you, Alex, how many times I referenced your blog posts on protected processes and all the code signing nuances involved with this stuff. Um, and the talk that you gave with James uh, a few years ago uh, was, was extremely informative. So thank you again. Um, so real quick primer, what are protected process light protections? Um, what do they aim to uh, protect code against? Uh, so this is, a, it's an anti-tampering feature designed to protect user mode processes, um, even from a user that's running a system. Um, I wanna highlight this is user mode. Um, exploiting vulnerable drivers is not in scope for this talk. Um, I'm gonna be attacking uh, Elam and PPL uh, using a, a different mechanism. Um, so if you're running protected, uh, well, processes that are running protected, uh, and an adversary in theory would not be able to start or stop them. Well, more accurately, they wouldn't be able to stop them. Um, you also wouldn't be able to get a handle to a protected process, uh, and you wouldn't be able to, say, attach a debugger to a protected process. Again, all from user mode. Um, so in order to run protected, uh, an executable would have to meet certain specific signing requirements. And in the case of anti-malware light processes, which is gonna be the focus of this talk, there are very particular code signing considerations um, that are required that we're ultimately going to abuse. So what do you need to be an early launch anti-malware or ELAM driver as I'll refer to it from now on? Um, so this is Microsoft's third party security feature made available to any security vendor that is a member of the Microsoft Virus Initiative Group um, to afford them anti-tampering protections that are native to the operating system. So within an Elam driver, and my understanding of Elam drivers, which is not that great, but um, is that you don't need to implement code in an Elam driver necessarily. Like there are low level callbacks that can be implemented if you wanted to do some like AV signature stuff like early in the boot process. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about that. The main area of focus here is an Elam driver has to have an embedded binary resource that specifies which signers and optionally, which signers with particular enhanced key usage attributes uh, must be applied to user mode code in order for it to run at the anti-malware uh, PPL level. And once a vendor who is a member of the MVI group uh, has an ELAM driver, uh, they would submit it to Microsoft um, and then assuming uh, that it uh, past Microsoft's rigorous uh, testing standards, Microsoft would then sign it um, and then their vendor code would be allowed to run as a protected service in user mode. 
So when I first started investigating these, I was curious what ELAM drivers are installed by default in Windows. So I used a little bit of WMI, really just to, um, based on the, on the documentation, it says that you're supposed to install ELAM drivers as a part of the early launch service group. And so this PowerShell one-liner is just enumerating all of the, um, the services in that service group. And by default, what you should almost always see is wdboot.sys. So I'm going to be picking on that one uh, for the initial examples here. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk about that allow list of hashes that an ELAM driver must have to specify what is allowed to run as a protected service in user mode. So this list is comprised of TBS, or to be signed hashes. These are not to be mistaken with thumbprints, thumbprints being SHA-1 hashes of the certificate. And I also believe the hashing algorithm is different. So even if the hashing algorithm in the certificate is SHA-1 and you get a TBS hash of it, it's going to be different than the thumbprint hash. Um, and this is really important to know the distinction because if you're going to be hunting for things that are abusable, like in VirusTotal, VirusTotal only understands thumbprint values. It doesn't have a concept of TBS hashes. Um, but code integrity in the kernel understands TBS hashes. Uh, and so that's what needs to be specified in that allow list. So if you're going to be auditing these things, what are some tools available to um, calculate those TBS hashes? Uh, there's Cert Manager. It's built into the Windows SDK. Just do Cert Manager dash V, give it the file, and it'll dump a ton of information, including the TBS hashes of every certificate in the chain. And I wrote a tool a while back uh, in PowerShell um, to do something similar. Um, again, VirusTotal doesn't understand TBS hashes. That's going to be relevant as we hunt for these things later. All right. So based on the documentation that Microsoft supplies, which is linked here, this is what the raw allow list looks like. This is a resource, again, embedded into the ELAM driver, which is then signed. So no, you shouldn't be able to tamper with this list and get it to run anything uh, without invalidating the signature and then not loading the ELAM driver. Um, so you would see uh, one or more of those TBS hashes along with its corresponding certificate um, hashing algorithm. Uh, and then optionally, emphasis on optional, Microsoft makes this optional, you can lock it down even further. So let's say as a vendor, you had a very, very particular code signing certificate for just your endpoint security products that are intended to run as a protected process. You could apply those EKUs to that certificate, and that would be wonderful um, if you um, had that kind of control over your certificates in, in your uh, vendor organization. Um, but again, that's optional, and that's going to be impactful uh, in a little bit. So here is an example of the hashes that are allowed in wdboot.sys. So there are two rules here. Um, you see the certificate hashes. Now, what certificates do those refer to? Um, that will be the next step in our process of uh, identifying what these actually are, because these can be really hard to, to track down um, just based on the hash, because um, as we'll see, uh, not all of these hashes will yield any results in Google, and so sometimes we have to get creative in identifying what these actually are. Um, good on Microsoft here for specifying particular EKUs. Um, these we'll see in another slide. These correspond to um, uh, anti-malware, um, like think of these EKUs as like Microsoft's anti-malware specific uh, EKU, which is great. Um, one very important thing to know here is that these hashes, I thought originally that these would just refer to the LEAF certificate, so like the actual code signing certificate for the, um, for the protected process, but this can actually refer to a certificate hash for an intermediate certificate as well. 
So there'll be some interesting ramifications there. So here I just wanted to show you the correspondence between the TBS hash and the thumbprint value, because as you're auditing these, you'll want to have that correspondence so you can search like in VirusTotal for these. So look at the F6F hash at the bottom, and that corresponds to that first rule that we just saw. And I took a known executable that I assumed would have that hash and um, went through its certificate chain, looked at the thumbprint, and then uh, at the same time uh, calculated the TBS hash. And sure enough, I get that one-to-one -one correspondence. So what information do I have? I now confirm that that F6F hash refers to the Microsoft code signing intermediate certificates. Okay, so what do those EKUs look like in the user mode code? So here we're looking at MSMP ENG.exe, like the Defender AV uh, service executable. So look to the bottom right of the slide and you'll, um, you'll see those two EKUs which were specified earlier. It's the first two. So there's the Microsoft Publisher one and then the unknown key usage. Um, when I did a little bit of recon, um, just trying to hunt down that EKU, that generally uh, I've only ever seen that applied to um, like anti-malware related products. So in a nutshell, these rules state that if in this case, MSMP ENG.exe wants to run as an anti-malware light protected service, then any chain, any certificate in its chain has to have that certificate hash, that F6F TBS hash, and any certificate in the chain must have those EKUs applied, okay? So um, I wanted to confirm that yes, indeed, uh, MSMP ENG ran protected, so I wrote a PowerShell function to um, you just pipe PS to get process protection level, and it will tell you the specific uh, protection level. In this case, like here, we're targeting the anti malware light uh, protection level. And then I also want to confirm because anything that runs anti malware should be running as a service, because this is how you install these things. Um, just uh, I'm showing the corresponding running service for the Defender AV engine. And then finally, uh, as you're installing these things um, of note for the WinDefend service, you'll see launch protected, that registry value set to three, and that corresponds to protected signer anti-malware. And that is the protection level that third-party security vendors get. You're at the anti-malware light level. There are higher, um, uh, protection levels. I'd recommend checking out James and uh, Alex's talk for more information on those. Okay, so again, Elam is an allow list for anti malware light PPL process execution as, as a service. Um, and so my question was what if that allow list is overly permissive? And how would we be able to determine if an allow list was overly permissive? And then what would the repercussions be of that? So let's talk about um, auditing Elam drivers. So what I did for this next stage of the research process was to go to VT. I've got a VT Enterprise account, and this was the search that I used. So all Elam drivers have a consistent Microsoft signature that is applied to them with this subject name. Um, and then I just searched for all device drivers. So that's a tag native. Anything, anything that was signed is a confirmed uh, PE file um, and did not have an invalid signature. And that yielded 886 files. Um, so I just downloaded all of those in bulk. I did some additional validation on them just as a sanity check. Um, once I pulled them down, I confirmed that on my host, they had a valid signature, that the name of the LEAF certificate was the one that we just saw in the VT search, same one there, and that it had a valid MS Elam cert 
info ID resource. That, again, is the resource that contains that list of hashes for user mode services that run at the anti-malware light level. So that reduced the number from 866 to 766. So I was still kind of surprised. I didn't realize that there might be that many unique uh, vendor ELAM drivers out there, but sure enough, there were. Um, the next thing I did was uh, when I parsed all those out, um, I just sorted by frequency of uh, vendors just to get a snapshot of like, what is the entirety of the ELAM third-party vendor ecosystem, and um, I know it will be challenging for you to see this, but if you can judge just based on the number of bullets, um, there are many vendors out there that have signed, approved ELAM drivers out there, all with their own respective set of certificate hashes. Um, and ideally, like you would hope that all of those hashes just refer to the vendor code, um, so, you know, we can cross our fingers and hope that that's the case. Um, there were some kind of odd ones that stood out to me. For example, in the like middle of the center column, there's one, uh, a vendor listed to do company name. Um, there's, a, there's an empty bullet on the left too. So there are several vendors that didn't have a vendor name um, in their like version info resource. Um, some other things just kind of surprised me, but I'm also kind of ignorant here, like Team Viewer was kind of interesting. Um, but again, like I'm not naming and shaming anyone, it's just these are some interesting results. Okay, so my strategy for auditing all of these drivers once I pulled them down was to parse out and dump all of those um, TBS hash allow rules. Um, just converted it to JSON, and then just started searching through that. And one of the strategies that I was used, or one of the um, things that I was interested in seeing was, are there any certificate hashes that cross vendor boundaries? So that could have been potentially interesting, because like, why would say, just hypothetical example, like in a carbon black ELAM driver, why would it have the same certificate hash as like an AVG driver? That wasn't actually the case, but like that's what I was potentially interested in seeing when I was doing this audit. So next, uh, you'd want to identify or try to identify the corresponding thumbprint for those TBS hashes so that you could actually search for executables and virus total. Um, and then if you found the corresponding hash, the thumbprint in virus total, um, then the process would be like, to try to look for potentially abusable applications that uh, you could try to get arbitrary unsigned code execution from. So one of the first vendors I looked at, again, I'm not picking on anyone here, but uh, I looked at the Carbon Black Elam driver. And so I was able to find the corresponding thumbprint. There were maybe like 100 or so uh, executables that uh, you could have run uh, protected. Um, that didn't actually yield anything, so like good on carbon black. I didn't find anything obviously abusable there. Um, and then, yeah, so as you find an executable, you go install it as a protected service and then try to get code execution from it if it's like an abusable application. So very manual process here. Again, I mentioned the challenge of uh, trying to associate TBS hashes to the thumbprint. Sometimes, I got lucky. Um, you'll see like there's only 10 hits for this Microsoft Intermediate Certificate hash. Um, and in the overwhelming majority of cases, there were zero uh, Google hits for these things. So I sometimes had to get creative in trying to associate TBS hash to thumbprint so that I could search in VT. Okay, um, like I said, sometimes you'll get lucky like this one random article happened to have the output of cert manager dash v so i could see very clearly the association between the tbs hash and the thumbprint value and the name of the certificate um, but in so many other cases i got nothing and then uh coming back to eku's um so if we were to just ignore that for a second um and just consider like 
like if in the WD boot uh, ELAM driver that anything that was issued by that Microsoft certificate could run protected, well, that would be a really bad problem because then like you'd see there are 171,000 executables at a minimum that could run protected. But because Microsoft specified that the binaries must have those EKUs applied in their code signing certificate, that narrows the possibilities drastically. And in the case of WD boot, it's allow rules. Um, that's pretty locked down. I couldn't find anything abusable there. So this was the result of manually going through those 766 ELAM drivers. Um, and these are the initial findings that I had. So um, what this is saying is that uh, if you were to obtain one of these overly permissive ELAM drivers, which I'm not going to specify, you can go find these yourself, um, but there are signed ELAM drivers that have rules that allow those two Microsoft certificates. And now these are Microsoft uh, certificates. These are not Windows certificates. The distinction is like Windows signed code is like inbox um, Microsoft code. Um, so anything signed by Microsoft, if again, if you find the right ELAM driver, and then in my opinion, almost even worse, uh, there were several vendors who had overly permissive rules that stated that uh, any of these intermediate certificate authority, uh, authorities um, could be allowed to run protected. So my only theory about why those Microsoft ones were in there is because perhaps, like, let's say a vendor took a dependency on the Microsoft Visual C runtime, right? Like, uh, you'd be loading that DLL, and, like, if you're, if you're taking that dependency, um, then those ELAM allow rules apply not only to the service executable, but all DLLs that get loaded into that process as well. So hypothetically, if you took that dependency, then you would need that um, allow rule in your ELAM driver rule, but that's bad. Um, and Microsoft allowed this to happen through the submission process. I guess it was, um, they, they just never really considered that uh, overly permissive ELAM drivers would be a big issue. So let's consider the VeriSign example. So I was able to associate the TBS hash to the thumbprint value, that one that starts with 495, or yeah, 495. Let's go into virus total. And what I wanted to do was I searched for anything that was signed with that certificate a valid signature that had 40 or more positive AV hits. And so I got a result of 177,000 malware samples that can now run at the anti malware light protected level. Okay, so armed with that knowledge, how would you go about weaponizing uh, and overly? permissive ELAM driver. So I mentioned before, like, again, you have to find the corresponding TBS hash. And this one, the one that starts with 602, that was the one that I identified in the previous slide of the overly permissive rules. So you go in VT, search for that. And because that was the Microsoft signature, um, the first lull bin, like, abusable binary that you can get arbitrary unsigned code execution from that came to mind was MS build. So sure enough, there were 16 unique MS build samples signed, legitimately signed with that certificate. So here are the steps. You have the overly permissive ELAM driver that you identified and pulled down from VT. Again, I won't be naming any of those, but you have, you're now armed with the, the queries to go find these yourself. So you, you would take the, that driver, drop it to disk, and then call install ELAM certificate info in kernel 32 um, to register those allow rules. Once you've done that, um, and of course you, you have to be admin to do all of this, um, 
then you would take the abusable binary that we just identified in this case, one of those 16 MS build executables, and then you'd install it as a protected service. So create service API and then call um, change service config two to specify like, hey, this is gonna be an anti malware light service. Start the service and hopefully profit. Uh, but then you'd also have to supply a payload to, to execute in the, the context of the protected service. So when I was abusing MS build, there were some weaponization constraints that I had to work through. Like I did confirm like, yes, indeed, yay, I can see that MS build is running as a protected service. Um, but I didn't, uh, at that point, I hadn't gotten full arbitrary code execution. And that's uh, one of the main reasons is because PPL processes don't permit spawning child processes by default. Uh, you have to be very explicit as a protected process. And um, like there, there are APIs that you can specify to say, hey, no, really, I want to spawn a protected child process. But because we're bringing in arbitrary executables that aren't designed to be run as protected services, um, they're not gonna be calling those APIs to spawn child processes. So um, by default, uh, that, that was a restriction that I had in this case for abusing MS build. Um, so I banged my head on the table for a while trying to figure that out. Um, and the, one of the things with MS build is like, it's great for like red teamers because in an inline XML file, you can just have straight up like C-sharp code with your payload. Um, it will compile it on the fly and then load it into the process and execute it. But that compilation step spawns a child process of csc.exe. So that was a constraint that I had to work through. Fortunately, Casey Smith tweeted many years ago about a variation for MS build payloads called property functions, which uses this very weird PowerShell like .NET syntax, which you more or less have to implement in like this ugly one-liner. Um, but I got it to uh, load a .NET assembly and instantiate um, like a, a constructor from that. And the benefit of property functions is that that compilation step doesn't occur. Um, it's like this pseudo inline like scripting language that is interpreted and not compiled. Um, so I was able to get around that limitation. And then in my payload, I just had it consume arbitrary PowerShell so that um, if, if you haven't been able to tell yet, I'm kind of a PowerShell fanboy. Um, I wanted to have my like weaponized script execute arbitrary PowerShell code uh, as, as a protected process. All right, so demo time. So in this first demo, um, first I'm, I'm gonna show you just a listing of all the protected processes. Okay, so we have two anti malware light -like processes. That's what we're focusing on. I've already mentioned MSMP, ENG.exe. And now using the weaponized script that I wrote, I can execute arbitrary PowerShell. I'm just having MS build like sleep for 10 seconds. And you can see indeed, MS build is running at the anti-malware protected level. And so that script that you saw, I wonder if I can go back a little bit here, um, invoke anti-malware light command. This just implements and abstracts away all of those steps necessary to weaponize this abuse primitive. Um, so I'm pointing it to my overly permissive ELAM driver. Again, I'm not naming it. Um, and then it will call that function to register those, um, those certificate allow rules. And then it will install, in this case, uh, MS build as a protected service. And then using that weaponization primitive using uh, property functions in MS build, um, it's creating a .NET assembly on the fly, that's just a PowerShell runner that will consume the, uh, the PowerShell script block that I give it there. So I'm gonna be releasing this code. Um, it's a defanged weaponized version, so you'll need to supply an ELAM driver, um, otherwise it's fully, fully weaponized. The other 
example I have here was instead of just like showing that I can run MS build as uh, an anti-malware light process, um, here I'm going to show I'm, I'm going to try to kill MSMP ENG. I'm running from an elevated prompt. You can see that I can't do it uh, using that same uh, weaponization, weaponized script. I'm going to run the same exact thing, just in the context of a protected process. I'm going to hit enter. And note the process ID was 3168 that I was trying to kill. And you'll see there's a new process ID there, implying that the previous one was killed and it automatically respawned. Okay, so, and then I found that if you ran it again, um, then it kills it even more <laughs> this time. Uh, and then you can see like it's no longer running and then on the bottom right, um, the defender shield went from green to red indicating that the service needed to be restarted. So what do we have here? First, let me talk about potential mitigations and detections for this and then uh, we're getting close to the conclusion. So the obvious mitigation would need to come from Microsoft in the future. Um, and I've been working with Microsoft uh, since December on this is when I reported it. Um, so please trust me in saying like Microsoft considers this, like they're taking this very seriously and um, are already uh, implementing steps to, uh, to mitigate this. Uh, it's pretty challenging to mitigate because this is just abusing the functionality that was supplied in Elam. And by the nature of understandably, like if you don't make those EKUs required, then no one's gonna use them, right? So like if Microsoft lets you get away with overly permissive Elam drivers, then I can't even blame the third party vendors. Like if you have silly dependencies on silly things, fine. Um, if through the approval process that's allowed, then like, I don't know, I, I just, I, I really can't beat up on, on the third party vendors. Um, an interesting finding for me was that if you do have WDAC, Windows Defender Application Control enabled, um, you can create an allow list of the Elam drivers that you want to permit, and then anything else would, um, would fail to, to load. So in this example, you'll see um, I explicitly allowed wdboot.sys, so there wasn't an error when trying to register that, um, but then anything else like overly permissive elam.sys uh, was not allowed to, uh, to load. So as far as detection is concerned, um, defenders, I would not focus on trying to detect the overly permissive Elam drivers being dropped. I don't think that would really yield much fruit, um, but I would consider focusing on any service creation where that launch protected value is set to three. In an enterprise, in theory, there should be relatively few legitimate anti-malware light services. So um, if you're in a position to detect anomalies where you have a new service created at the anti-malware light level um, with a corresponding binary that is suspicious, like MS build, um, I, would, I would detect off that. Uh, now vendors, I certainly recommend applying EKUs if you're one of those anti-malware vendors. Um, so like th this is just good practice anyway, like Microsoft gave you the functionality and the feature in Elam to specify very specific e EKUs. Like I would just encourage you to consider implementing that. Don't be the reason that the entire Elam ecosystem is ruined for everyone else. So, um, just to reiterate, uh, one single overly permissive Elam driver, once you've gone out and identified what that one or many would be, poisons the entire well across the entire third party anti-malware ecosystem. If you're relying upon this feature of um, the anti-malware light uh, uh, protection level. 
So all it takes is that one to effectively ruin it for, for everyone. Um, and this is my, my nice way of saying it, that the, the vetting process for ELAM drivers is far from robust. Um, it should have been much stronger from the get-go. Like, for example, like if a third-party vendor said that any Microsoft signed certificate uh, should be allowed to run, like that should raise some red flags, potentially. Um, same would go for allowing intermediate certificates and not having those EKU values in there, but even that would be dangerous as well, because um, that could be abused um, in other scenarios. So in summary, uh, it, if you are able to achieve arbitrary code execution as a protected process, you not only can kill the existing security products that are running at the same level, which I demonstrated by killing the Defender AV service, um, but your malware is afforded the same anti-tampering protections as, um, as the, the anti-malware um, security products are. So that's why that's bad. Um, disclosure timeline, I reported this to MSRC in December. I knew that MSRC wouldn't care because this is not a security boundary. It's a security feature. Um, so they closed it pretty shortly thereafter. No shocks there, and that's okay. I'm not upset. It's not a security boundary. Uh, I reported it to the Defender Research team, so passed everything on to them. Um, and they've been awesome to work with. Um, so shout out to David Kaplan, Gil Besso, and Philip Zuckerman. Um, been working with them pretty regularly on this, um, and they've just been a wonder to work with. So um, I'll just offer the verbiage that Microsoft supplied here. Um, so I've been working with uh, Microsoft, and they have been communicating with their MVI partners to address the issue. Um, and yeah, we'll just leave it at that. All right, so I'll leave you with some resources. I will be posting these slides to GitHub. Well, they're actually on my GitHub now uh, on manifestation. So if you want to learn more about these, um, there's some good references here. And then uh, all the code is available as well. So manifestation, search for anti-malware blight, little play on words there. Uh, and again, it, it's a defanged uh, weaponized script, so you will have to go find an Elam driver yourself and supply it. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, pretty nice. I'm a couple of curiosity to ask. The first one, the install ELAM certificate API. As far as I remember, I may be wrong because I don't take these things since forever. It requires a reboot of the target system or does not? It does not require a reboot. So you can just ah. do it dynamically at runtime. I yep. see, thank you. And then another thing that I was wondering, like uh, we saw that in this attack, basically the permissive anti-malware like driver have just like the hash of the, cert the intermediate certificate and does not require any EQ. I'm curious, when you did the research in um, Virus Total, the things that you found, they could even be explicitly launched as a PPL, meaning that they have the AQ into the, the signature or not? Like, for example, you get like the example of MS Build. MS Build, as far as I remember, doesn't, shouldn't have like the uh, AQ, anti-malware anti AQ to run as an anti-malware level, right? I'm wondering if you check this even in like, calling create process and putting the PPL level uh, like uh, directly from the, those executable that you found? Um, not sure I understand the question fully. Uh, <laughs> like okay. was it, um, like did I try calling like create process um, to, uh, I guess like re rephrase the question, no, I'm yes, sorry. sorry. Yeah. So anti-malware driver contains the allow list. Okay, yep. but usually for start a um, PPL process, you need to call create process with a particular flag. Yes, Which correct. basically then uh, check the EQ in the digital signature of the, the, execu the, the executable base image. The and EKU then say, assuming that the ELAM driver had the EKU specified. No, 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 take out the ELAM drivers as normal. The OS is even able to launch PPL directly without even an ELAM certificate. Oh, sure. But yeah. it needs to require the EQ. At a higher protection EQ. level. Exactly. Yes. 
So I'm wondering, those processes that you found, I'm very curious to say, they were, they were, they add this EQ into the signature or not? For example, MS build, I'm pretty sure that is not because you can't like literally create the process um, uh, MS build without an ELAM driver that allow, allow that. But the others? Uh, like the third party? Yeah, ones? the one that you found. You, you showed like thousands of files that they were like properly si signed for like. Um, oh, was that for the, the Microsoft ones that I showed? Yes, exactly. Oh, sure. So, um, yeah, so the, there were a couple uh, Elam drivers that I identified that had those Microsoft um, certificates in there with no EKUs specified. So, Trying to recall, I don't believe I saw among those 766 Elam drivers. I believe it was only the Microsoft ones that have EKUs specified. So, of the ones that allow arbitrary Microsoft signed stuff, they don't have the EKU restriction, and so you drop those drivers, install the certificate info, and then run arbitrary Microsoft code as as protected. Does that does that? answer your question yeah more or less okay. i was even interested about the payload like for example use ms build as a payload for doing some malicious stuff yeah but you found a lot of payload possible payloads that were signed by microsoft or like whatever that oh. is on the list sure i was curious if those payload contains also the aq or not oh uh no they don't ah, okay that yeah. that's that sorry. was the sorry question. I, I, no I worries didn't capture that. great talk by the way thank you thanks mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't find any overtly abusable executables that had the EKUs applied. Um, I also haven't done a full audit of them because I have no easy way of searching. Uh, well, I could probably do like a, a retro hunt um, in VT to search for those EKUs, but I just never bothered to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, maybe a philosophical question, so if you don't want to answer. Um, Given that you mentioned the dependency, uh, the dependency speculation as to why they might have added Microsoft hashes, yeah. um, but I think James mentioned in you know a talk you referenced that automatically if you're Microsoft signed, you can load in in anti malware, right? So theoretically, any Microsoft publisher, you, you wouldn't need to do that essentially. So do you have any speculation that maybe some of those vendors may have? use that as, as backdoors, as testing, as, you know, anything like that, or you think it's just mistakes and accidents and... My imagination can run wild. Um, there were some pretty shady rules and what, from my perspective, look like shady vendors, but I'm just, you know, painting a picture full of biases here. Um, but to me, that doesn't even matter because um, again, from my bias perspective, the legitimate vendors that had overly permissive rules poisons the well for everyone. So even if there were hypothetically backdoored overly permissive Elam drivers, um, it wouldn't even matter. And, uh, you know, that would probably burn that company so much more easily because, you know, you've got your target right on you at that point. So, um, yeah, I guess now uh, there, there's more to hide behind the, the legitimate Elam drivers that can just blanket allow anything to run. Thanks. All right. Thanks again, everyone.